morning. Let's talk a little bit about population density in Japan as we start to understand population in Asia in general. Um, remember that population density has to do with the amount of people that are living in a certain space. So a high population density involves a space where a lot of people are squished together. Um, the book talked about 878 people per square mile in Japan. As opposed to a low population density, similar area, less people, more space to spread out. That's a low population density. Um, <clears throat> Japan, our island nation, um, for a little bit of a review about where it's located and um, how the land was actually formed, a reminder that we have tectonic plates and Japan happens to be located where two plates are converging together and creating a mountainous area which also then creates um, volcanoes and earthquakes. Earthquakes that happen underwater then have the um, added um, consequence of creating these tsunamis or large waves that then wash ashore, which um, one of the tsunamis triggered by an earthquake um, hit northern Japan a couple of years ago, um, overcoming a nuclear power plant in the Iwaki Fukushima uh, prefecture, and that is an area that we'll look at a little bit more in detail um, that's still having some environmental consequences. Um, when you're talking about Japan, one-eighth of the entire country is considered arable. And remember that arable is a distinction that talks about land that's suitable for farming, um, meaning that it gets adequate sunlight, that it isn't too rocky, that the soil is appropriate, um, or it's not too steep or too highly elevated. Um, this creates an uneven population distribution. It's not like people can spread out anywhere they want on the islands of Japan. They have to live where um, living is possible. So 80% of the people in Japan live on the flat areas near the coasts. Um, they threw two vocabulary words at you, arithmetic population density and physiological um, population density. Basically, one is numbers and one is space. So if you think about arithmetic as if all land was equal and I could live and spread out wherever I wanted as opposed to physiologic numbers which are more accurate because they only include arable land, meaning that I'm only going to be able to spread out on land that's available to me, not land that's a fiery volcano um, lava pit. So I, I'm going to be more squished together, even though these would have the same arithmetic population density, this number is going to be more accurate to how much space people actually have to live in. So hopefully you understand the basics of population density, and now we're going to look at how people in Japan have adapted their lives to um, a, a, the challenge of uh, high population density. Um, we have... Uh, the small island of Japan as opposed to the large um, uh, nation of the United States. Um, and that's going to create differences in our transportation. If you think about uh, what people drive in the United States, we have a lot of our own personal cars, and those cars are big. We have SUVs, we have minivans, and whereas in Japan you're going to see a lot of bicycles, mopeds, um, small cars, and a lot of public transportation. One of the things they mention in the chapter is the idea of commute time and how that impacts your life because most people get up, go to work in the morning and come home. And so the time that it takes you to get from your house to your place of business is your commute. Um, and when you have a lot higher population density, that creates a lot of traffic. Um, I had friends living in Hawaii for several years who talked about a four-hour commute because basically there was one main highway that would get you to the downtown area and everybody on the island got on that highway at the same time. So um, you just couldn't go very fast. So more people equals more traffic. And so ways of dealing with that is to get people out of their individual private cars and into public transportation. Japan has been able to develop a very efficient public transportation system. Um, they talked about subway pushers, and your book had a image of person some shoving people into subway cars. Um, get them on, get them off quickly and efficiently, no time for worries, and go. Um, they also have large distance trains that are called bullet trains. You'll also see these in Europe. Um, in Japan they're called Shinkansen and um, we know that public transportation is better for the environment too. You can get to work faster um, at less expense to yourself uh, with better impact on the environment. 
So they do try to limit private cars, although that is becoming much more popular in Asia um, in general, is having your own individual private car. Um, however, the challenge of owning a car is where do you park it? Um, and if we've ever stopped to think about how much of the time our cars actually sit empty, as opposed to actually transporting us from place to place, it's kind of putting things into perspective about whether we all actually need our own independent individual cars. Um, but Japan does have strict rules about ownership. If you don't have a place to park it, you can't own a car. And the idea that um, they're using their technology to benefit them in terms of um, helping out with this transportation issue. Um, they have large parking garages where computers will park your cars stacked very closely together like a shoebox they mentioned. Um, and if anybody's seen Mission Impossible 4, good movie, um, set in Asia, uh, there's, a, there's an example of a parking garage at the end. So, uh